Jordan Peterson, who I've recently been watching. Mm. What attracted you to him? Well, it was his beautiful speaking voice mainly. <laughs> um, I, 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 uh, well, I, I started watching his lectures a long time ago when they came out on YouTube. I think it was like 2015. Um, and I think I just liked the psychoanalytic stuff he did about old Bible stories and he would weave bits of Jungian mythology in there. And I enjoyed all that. Um, and then as the years went by, it sort of morphed into he became the a, a mouthpiece or, or one of the people who was speaking against this movement towards the woke culture. And uh, so his... He went from being somebody who I found interesting and was interested to listen to, not that I agreed with everything that he was saying, to sort of a real respect for him as somebody who had the courage to say what he was saying in the conditions that we were living through, um, where you know the consequences could be really, really bad. And they were for him. The, the consequences for him, for him were really, really difficult um, because... We are kind of going through a soft uh, cultural revolution at the moment. What is your definition of woke culture? Well, I think it's a, it's a poisonous combination of radical leftism, very poorly understood Marxism, like, like undigested Marxism, resentment, uh, ressentiment in the Nietzschean sense, uh, hatred of power, hatred of the rich, um, and a kind of obsession with uh, with safety. Uh, there's a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, and the, the author of that book, I think it's Jonathan Haidt, uh, coins the term safetyism. We're becoming anti-tough. We're becoming very, very fragile, generally speaking. So you put all these elements together, plus you have like an exploding student population of way too many graduates now with useless degrees um, who are indoctrinated into this nonsense. And before you know it, you've got like this generation that's become an army of useless saints who, who, are, there, who are here to save us all from, I don't know, the oppressive patriarchy or whatever babbling buzzwords they use. <laughs> is this a repetition of the cycle of the younger generation always rocking the boat with the older generation there's uh yes and no this isn't gangster rap this isn't punk uh for our generation it would have been the rave scene and prodigy and maybe industrial metal and uh carl cox and all that and drum and bass but that was that was where you Every generation that did that through rock and roll and, and to, all the way through to jazz, it was we're young, we're virile, we're sexual, and we're going to do what we're going to do. And there's always an undertone of like um, uh, sort of a resilient, red-blooded rebellion there. Uh, this is not that. This is a rebellion of the weak. This is like, uh, it's, it's to, to me, I don't think it's an overstatement to say it's a death cult because it's anti-life. What it says is, if you exist, which you do, you're guilty of crimes that you can never absolve. And it's, you know, like if you're white, that's a terrible crime. What, what, can, I, what can I do? Nothing. So I just be white and guilty for the... Yes, forever. Damn, that's... You know, you're a man. Okay, can I do anything about that? No, you'll be a man. And, and it, but it's, it's for everybody. And it's like every single left-wing cultural revolution it becomes a snake eating its own tail this happens to Khmer Rouge it happened in Maoist China it happened under Stalin and it will happen with these people it starts attacking everyone even their own allies because you can never be woke enough so everybody's guilty of some crime at some point and uh, it seems like the whole purpose of the thing is to make people feel bad for existing and that's that's not a philosophy that's an anti-philosophy it's a death cult so how did Jordan Peterson bump heads with these people well, he's, um, I just started a sentence with, well, I sound just like him. Well, the thing <laughs> is, um, he's obviously, he's a, he's a professor. Uh, he was a professor at Harvard um, and he's a lifelong academic. So he would have seen 
the worst, most extreme elements of this because they re- it really is a sort of a mind, a parasitic mind virus that's flourished in the academic institutions. Parasitic mind virus. <laughs> so he, almost as good as the orb of evil. <laughs> the impenetrable orb of, of evil. gleaming evil. Um, yeah, the, this, this is a parasitic mind virus. Gad, Gad Saad just wrote a book uh, uh, about that called The Parasitic Mind, which I recommend. So where he started to bump up against it was where... The typical, I mean, I was a radical leftist when I was a student. Loads of people are Marxist when they're young because you don't have anything. You look at the world, you're young and idealistic. You're predominant. You think the, you think the most important thing in life is fairness. And then you go old, you get older, sadly. Uh, I tried not to, it didn't work. <laughs> and you're like, maybe the most important thing in life isn't fairness because life isn't fair we should try to be fair we should try to be just but you can't force fairness on people it's unnatural if things are left to their own devices the jungle is a very unfair place (laughs) the desert's a very unfair place we as humans who are civilized we should try but it, it can't be the ultimate value of a society to be fair so you grow out of it and I think what what's happened is it was always fringe it was always like a a fringe thing so when I was a kid, I was obsessed with sexism and racism and, and the way in which the patriarchy had done this, that and the other thing. And then you grow up and you think, well, actually, the patriarchy's also given me my iPhone and my trainers and my medical system. And I, you can't view everything through a political lens. It doesn't work. It becomes um, disintegrative, which is the essence of the postmodern movement. It's based on social constructionism and it deconstructs everything. Great. Well done. You've deconstructed everything. Now what? Now we're supposed to live in a communist utopia? Well, you know that that doesn't work because if you put people in a situation where everybody is equal, the first thing that humans do is try to establish a dominance hierarchy. You're all going to eat at the same time. You're all going to go to bed at the same time. None of you have any possessions. How long does it take for men in that environment to create a dominance hierarchy? They'll do it before they've even walked through the fucking door (laughs) because they're checking each other out to see who's who in the dominance hierarchy. So it, it just doesn't work. So I think Jordan Peterson ran afoul of a, just a, a growing movement. And I think it was just time. It was just that moment in human history uh, where things became very, very confrontational for him. How did that manifest in the public domain? The, the thing that he's known for famously is for um, pushing back against the Canadian Bill C-16 that meant if you misgendered somebody publicly, it would be uh, designated under Canadian law as a hate crime and you could get a custodial sentence for it. That was his interpretation. I've read around it from Canadian legal experts and they said that's actually untrue. Nobody was ever going to go to jail, but it was going to be considered a hate crime and he didn't like that. So you're saying this has gone beyond youthful idealism oh, into changing the laws. It's changing the laws and it's in our corporations. Coca-Cola is woke. Your local bank is woke. Um, I, I mentioned Douglas Murray to you before. He's a friend of Jordan Peterson's and he is a, a gay man. And he says, I don't want my bank to do a month of gay pride. I want them to reduce my interest rates and keep the queues shut. <laughs> like, stop with the, it's just, it's just shallow virtue signaling. What I've been saying to young people is if a corporation is backing your cultural revolution, it probably isn't a real revolution. If a corporation is is funding your Marxist revolution, it probably isn't a real Marxist revolution. So a corporation wants to maximise its profits. Yeah. So attitudes have changed so much or are transforming so much that they believe, because they've done an analysis on this, that by incorporating this, they're going to make more money. Mm-hmm. And they're which, right. Which perpetuates it. A hundred percent. And then it becomes even more, if it becomes self-fulfilling, they make even more money because even yes. more people jump on. And Yes. It's, it's, like an, it's like a revolution. It's an anti-revolution. These kids don't realize that the real revolution that's going on right now, especially if I can, if I can raise the, the pandemic, is the huge transfer of wealth from down to up. It's destroying the middle classes. And by pushing for this particular woke revolution, which is, it's beyond political correctness. It's beyond polite. Of course, we should be polite. Of, of course, we should respect people. And if somebody said to me, I prefer it if you address me as her instead of he, what difference does it make? You're a nice person. I like you. Sure. If that makes you feel comfortable, why wouldn't I? 
There's a difference between politely requesting and saying, if you don't do this, there'll be terrible consequences. <laughs> you can end up in jail or, or beaten up, as some people have been. So every movement has within it the genesis of an anti-movement. Yes. Have we seen that with this woke? Yeah, I think I think um, I think that's actually a really profound statement you just made. There is always yin and yang. There's always yang inside of yin. So yes, there is um, an anti uh, movement within the movement, and I think where you see, I mean, the rise of Jordan Peterson was meteoric because as this became more popular, a lot of people who were in what Douglas Murray has referred to as the silent majority were recoiling in horror. But we did it silently because. Well, what do you? What do you suppose? I'm not crazy. I'm not going to run around the streets banging pots and pans. So I was like, I don't really know what to do with this, but I can get behind a Jordan Peterson. I can get behind a Douglas. Moore. I can get behind the public intellectual that says, "Hey, you know, maybe this is not a great as great an idea as we all seem to think it is." <laughs> so um, I think I think that accounts for, I mean, his cultural relevance right now. So in the uh, within the younger generation, then. Mm. Is the anti-movement looking up to people like Jordan? Is he like the kingpin of, of the intellectual? I think so. I think. I, I mean, I think he certainly he certainly has been. Um, he got he got very sick and he disappeared from the scene for for about a year. Um, but he certainly has been. And there is what you can see now in younger Gen Z is a move away from uh, wokeism. But it's so powerful. I think like a lot of people sat at home, if they're not involved in education, they're not in a corporation and they're not involved in a university, they won't realise how very, very strong it is. It's, it's got real power behind it now. And what's Nietzsche's role in this? I, I read a few Nietzsche books in prison. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, it's, it's, um, there's the Nietzsche's concept of ressentiment, which is, pardon my French, it's, where it's resentment, but you identify a target and you say this is all their fault. Mm. Which, if it doesn't make you think of the Nazis and the Jews, I don't know what will. It's got that, it's not just Stalinist. There's national socialist echoes in this as well. And it is Nietzsche's slave morality writ large. It's the opposite of the master morality. It's um, it's the prevalence of the weak who have reconstructed a story because they're in a weak position of power in, in culture and in society. They say, well, we are weak. We don't have the wealth. We don't have the power, but we're morally superior, which makes this actually many people have made this point it's actually got like a religious element to the movement it's like a new spirituality a new orthodoxy a new fundamentalism inclusive of inquisitions and witch burnings